is accountable. We have another student question on the uh, sensitive issue of religion in America. In the light of the events in the past decade, Islam has been viewed as a religion for extremists and terrorists, where Muslims, including myself, can attest that Islam is far from that. Now recently there has been much controversy over the mosque being built in the vicinity of Ground Zero and also the Florida pastor making outrageous remarks about the Quran. Now my question to you is, as Senator, where is the line between the freedom of speech and the respect of other religions, both of which freedoms are found in the First Amendment of the Constitution? Mr. Coons. A great question uh, and a difficult one. The Florida pastor who caused a lot of outrage by threatening to burn the Quran. Um, showed a profound misunderstanding of the difference between the Islamic terrorists, the extremists who genuinely attacked America uh, and I think deserve our condemnation, and the vast majority of Muslims uh, who participate in a, uh, a religion whose fundamental principle is commitment to peace and to embracing the rest of humanity. If that Florida pastor wanted to make the right point, he should have threatened to burn the readings and the teachings of Osama bin Laden or of other folks who are part of the Islamist extremist groups. It is an important challenge, a key role for the United States Supreme Court to continue to draw the line in the First Amendment between those who would do the equivalent of calling fire in a crowded theater, who would be inciting to attack and riot, such as Osama bin Laden has in some extremist and hateful writings, and those who have scripture, religious traditions that are deserving and worthy of broad support. Those are difficult lines to police, and that's a central role that the Supreme Court plays in our democracy. Well, I would agree. The Supreme Court has said that there are restrictions on our First Amendment rights. Again, uh, you know, you can't, as you said, go into a crowded theater and yell fire. You can't stand up on a plane and yell hijack. You can't slander and liable someone. However, where the question has come between what is protected free speech and what not has, what is not protected free speech, the Supreme Court has always ruled that the communities, the local community, has the right to decide. And in the issue with the 9-11 mosque, that's exactly where the battle is being fought, by the community members who are impacted by that, and I support that. But the, commu the community members have, the, the, at least the city council, the mayor, and, and the representatives, the elected representatives support this, uh, this mosque and, and community center that's supposed to be built near 9-11. And a lot of the people on the ground do not, and they're going to have a lot to face from their constituents, and maybe the re-election is even going to be uh, jeopardized. Should this uh, cultural center and mosque near 9-11 be built? There's already, cultural, there's already mosques uh, in many locations in Manhattan. Uh, and as you mentioned, I would defer to the decision of the local land use authorities, the folks who were elected by that community, to make decisions about where, when, and how things ought to be built. I don't think it was a wise choice of location, but I can't stand here and say that we should prevent folks from practicing their religion anywhere in the United States. To say that we will say, you can't build a mosque here, violates one of our most fundamental principles. Well, we've talked religion. about the Supreme Court, and obviously a United States senator has the opportunity to determine, in a way, the makeup of that court. So what opinions of late that have come from our high court do you most object to? Oh, gosh. Um, give me a specific one. I'm sorry. <laughs> Actually, I can't because the, I need you to tell me which ones you object to. Um, I'm very sorry right off the top of my head. I know that there are a lot, but uh, I'll put it up on my website. I promise you. Well, we know you disagree with Roe versus Wade. Yeah, but that was, she said a recent one. Well, that's relatively She said of recent. late. Yeah. Well, Roe versus Wade would not put the power, it's not, it's 30 some years old. But soul. since then, have there been any other <laughs> Supreme Court decisions? But let me say about Roe versus Wade, Roe versus Wade, if that were overturned, would not make abortion illegal in the United States. It would put the power back to the states. But besides that decision, anything else you disagree with? Oh, there are several when it comes to pornography, uh, when it comes to court decisions, uh, to not just Supreme Court, but federal court decisions to give terrorist Mirandized rights. I mean, there's a lot of things that I believe that this, uh, this California decision to overturn Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I believe that there are a lot of federal judges who are legislating from the That bench. wasn't the Supreme Court, it's a lower That was court. a federal judge, that's it what I said a, in yeah. California. Which, yeah. which Supreme Court decisions, if any, do you, do, do you disagree with? The most recent one um, that I've been engaged in, we've talked about, is Citizens United. Uh, I think the Citizens United case takes a sort of logical extension in the law uh, but takes it to a ridiculous extreme. Um, corporations really aren't entitled to the same free speech rights, in my view, as people. Um, and in Delaware, America's corporate capital, you would think we would be fighting for the rights of corporations. But in terms of political contributions, the free speech rights of corporations, I don't think deserve the same protections as the free speech rights of real, living, breathing, voting humans. 
Uh, and so I would disagree with that decision, and I would act to try and find ways to limit it, narrow it, or even overturn it. Anything else? That's the most important one. Let's uh, take another question from a student on energy right now. My question is, where do you think funding should be placed in order to move towards the United States decreasing its carbon footprint? Mr. Coons. Well, the most effective investment in reducing um, emissions of CO2 and other uh, things that cause gr greenhouse gas warming uh, is energy efficiency and conservation. There was a significant investment in the stimulus bill in getting municipalities, local governments, um, the private sector to invest in efficiency and conservation. And those are investments that reduce emissions, put people to work, and can develop cutting edge technologies that make our systems uh, operate better and to reduce not just the emissions but also the operating expenses. In Newcastle County, uh, we took $3.8 million in EECBG grants and combined it with $4 million of our own and retrofit 20 county buildings. We reduced our operating costs, we reduced our emissions, and we ultimately put folks to work here in our own community. As you look at those kinds of investments around the country, they're the most important, the, they, they have the most impact of anything you can do that will actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions. There's many more things we need to do to improve the efficiency of operating power there. plants. Excuse me. Well, I think the best way to address that that is most relevant to this U.S. Senate race is to talk about the issue of cap and trade because the winner of this U.S. Senate race can be immediately sworn in and serve it in Harry Reid's lame duck session and vote on cap and trade. Well, I do believe that we have to be good stewards of this earth. We don't need to do it at the expense of our citizens, and cap and trade will do that. I, whether it's farmers, senior citizens, or realtors who are concerned about its green community, nobody this bill is a national energy tax that will ration energy use and increase our utility bills. Senior citizens are concerned about the cost of the, their utility bills going up. Farmers are concerned about the green compliance standards and the raised utility bills shutting down their operations. And realtors are concerned about the green compliance standards hurting an already hurting housing market. But I would have to ask my opponent, speaking of cap and trade, your family business stand to financially benefit from some environmental legislation under under Bush. The minutes would up, your, so let's toss this to him very Would your quickly. business... A fascinating question um, that really makes no sense yet, so if you'd like to because let I, her yes, ask the please, whole question, I'd be yeah, interested I, in I, what she's like talking to about. <laughs> I'd like to know if your family business stands to have a financial gain if cap and trade is passed, and if so, would you recuse yourself in the lame duck session from voting with Harry Reid? A fascinating question. No, to the best of my knowledge, there is no direct financial benefit. Uh, and I do think it's important for folks in public office to conduct themselves ethically, to be transparent, and to be accountable for decisions they make and for votes that they cast. Um, I am someone who thinks that greenhouse gases are a concern, are a problem for the long term. And I think we need to take steps to rein them in and to deal with the environmental consequences that they might present. Well, l let me uh, ask uh, uh, Ms. O'Donnell, what evidence do you have that any family business that he has would uh, stand to gain from a cap and trade? Because they make fuel cells. Who's and, they? Uh, uh, W.L. Gore. They, they make some of the stuff that will be required by these businesses to regulate cap and trade. So Is that true? Uh, that's quite a stretch. Um, Gore makes over 1,000 products. Uh, it was difficult for me to understand from her question what she was talking about. Um, Gore is uh, a company that makes lots and lots of products, from implantable medical devices to dental floss, um, to some uh, membranes that are component parts that go into systems that go into fuel cells. Fuel cells are not currently fielded broadly in the United States. Uh, it's a cutting edge technology that someday has the promise of being a significant contributor uh, to making a more energy efficient, uh, cleaner transportation future. Um, but to me, the impact is so uh, distant from any particular proposal on cap and trade, it took a couple minutes to even understand what she was talking about. On this issue of energy, and let's just wrap up this sec section with this. Uh, yesterday, the Obama administration announced it was lifting the moratorium on deep water oil drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. Do you support this kind of offshore oil drilling? Well, that, that has raised the issue of whether or not we support it here in Delaware because that move by Obama would allow that. No, I don't want to see oil rigs off the state of Delaware. However, it should be up to the states to decide. And if Governor Mark Kell and our state legislatures in Dover were to pass legislation for that, then the, I shouldn't, as a congressman, overstep a state's rights. Virginia wants it. Not only that, we have got to begin to wean ourselves off of foreign oil. 
We are dependent on, on potentially hostile countries like Russia and Venezuela, while our own homeland is rich with natural resources, whether it's oil or natural gas. And there are states that do want to begin exploration, Alaska, Virginia. We as a government need to support those states who do want it. You agree or disagree? Um, I opposed uh, the president's proposal to open the Outer Continental Shelf off of Delaware uh, to oil drilling when it was first made months ago. Uh, I frankly think that Delaware's world-class beaches shouldn't be at risk of being spoiled by oil spills. Uh, we depend on tourism, on our fisheries. There's lots of reasons, I think, why it just doesn't make sense for most of the Atlantic coast. I do think there are natural energy resources in this country. We can and should beginning, begin to exploit more fully. But I'd also prioritize investments in alternative energy technologies. The University of Delaware has long been a world leader in solar power, for example, and has a key role to play in making wind power real. Offshore wind power, solar power, these are the sorts of areas where I'd prefer to see federal investment and new innovative opportunities that could create good jobs for the long term. Let's, we have time it? to throw in one more issue here um, can, before can I, we go to closing I, statements. We okay. are kind of <laughs> drawing down on time. And this is an issue that I think that can really illustrate the differences perhaps between the two of you. And that is what specifically would you and could you do to actually help end any of the bitter partis bipartisan nonpartisanship in Washington? So what would you be able to do as an individual once you arrive in Washington? Well, I've had to fight my party to, to be here on this stage to win the nomination. And to some extent, I am still fighting my party. So my, when I go to Washington, my allegiance will be to the voters of Delaware, not any special interests. My whole campaign has been about returning the political process back to the people of Delaware. And to me, that's a great thing. So what I would do is I would stand strong on legislation that benefits the interest of our citizens, not the special interests in Washington, D.C. And I would stand there and not just vote against a piece of legislation, but make the floor speeches that would try to convince my colleagues on both sides of the aisle who've lost their way and given in to, to partisanship so much that it has caused several stalemates as to why this is in the best interest of their constituents. And I would stand firm, regardless of what kind of pressure was on me from either party, to stand firm in doing what is right for the people of Delaware, not the interests in Washington. I frankly don't think my opponent can or has pointed to one single example where she supports the current administration or an initiative of the Democratic Party. I have a true. real practical record of having reached bipartisan solutions here in county government, of working with the elected Republicans who've served with me on county council and on council while I've been county executive. I've got a real hands-on record here in the private sector and in my service in partnership with the private sector of reaching out to folks from different political backgrounds, from different experiences, and from different worldviews to work with them to find solutions. I think that's the kind of record that Delawareans will look at in judging whether or not I've got the capacity to address well, some of this I, endless partisan On victory. this specific issue, uh, and, and Ms. O'Donnell raised it earlier, I'll give you a chance to clarify, to explain. She says that Harry Reid, the Senate Majority Leader, has called you his pet. Yes. I don't know why Harry Reid said that. I'm nobody's pet. I'm going to be a bulldog for Delaware. I'm running to represent all Delawareans of whatever party, not just the Democrats. And I've got a significant amount of support from independents, from Republicans, from Democrats, from all three counties. I've got a record of independence and of fighting for the public interest as county executive, and I would continue that in Washington. And just to well, clarify another point uh, from earlier, just to make sure we tie this up, uh, earlier you said you didn't want to have to talk about comments you made years ago about witchcraft and stuff like that. But in this commercial that's so widely seen, you begin the commercial with the words, I am not a witch. Put what, it were to you rest. what were you thinking? To put it to rest, to put it behind But didn't you me. realize if you do that in a commercial, it would just revive it and everybody would be, be talking about that? Well, we're moving past that and we're talking about the issues. I'd like to what, address what my opponent just said about 